Good afternoon and welcome to Into the Absurd, a virtually existential dinner conversation. I'm Erica Holscher, Associate Artistic Director of the Idiopathic Radiculopathy Consortium. Welcome to our conversation. A few housekeeping details before we commence. This conversation will be recorded and in order to keep the conversation going, please mute your audio and video and hide all non-video participants. To do that, you click the up arrow next to the video camera icon in the lower left corner of your screen, go to video settings and click the option that says hide non-video participants, which is the fourth option down under meetings. While we're pondering these existential musings, please chime in on the chat function if you have questions or comments as we bring good nothingness to life. And now, Tina Brock, producing artistic director and founding member of the IRC. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us for Into the Absurd, a virtually existential dinner conversation. Here every week, uh, Saturdays at 5 p.m., we are going to sit around the table and bring good nothingness to life as we meet with some of our favorite performers, actors, activists, people in the community who are doing interesting things and thinking about the world in a very interesting and challenging time. As you know, the IRC will not be on the stage in June and September, and while we will certainly miss that time with you, what we look forward to is expanding the conversation here about the ways in which theater companies, very small theater companies, just like the IRC, can contribute to the community and contribute to the conversation in a way that expands and broadens the definition of what it means to create theater in a brave new world. And so for that, I will be uh, every week discussing and talking and chewing the fat more or less and hopefully bringing some ideas to good, to good fruit, if you will, here. Uh, at the table. And I'm very delighted today to be joined by Dr. Marsha Ferguson, who is a, a lecturer, a senior lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania. She has her PhD from Contemporary American Theater from the City University of New York. And I am fortunate enough to have worked with Marsha on a project here in Philadelphia. I got to know her and I think I'm so excited to talk to her today about the work that she's doing both at the University of Pennsylvania and her dissertation was on the work of Blanca and Yuri Ziska, and she'll certainly talk more about that when she comes on today. Um, and I'm very interested to talk to her about that work and plans or thwarted plans to go to Edinburgh this year and what she has planned for the fall at the University of Pennsylvania. So why don't we bring Marsha to the table now? And there she is. Welcome, Marsha. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm delighted to talk to you more about the questions. Part of the, the reason for this show was, you know, I, there are so many times where you meet someone and you want to spend a lot more time talking to them at, at a cocktail party or at a dinner party. And while um, certainly those things happen, I just feel like sometimes we don't get that one-on-one -on -one time or that time to really focus into the things that really could create a larger conversation for the community. And there are so many people in this community doing really exciting work. So I just want to thank you for being there today. And I, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, of, of the many questions that I have on, on the docket today, um, your work recently, um, you hosted a, uh, your, and I'll, I'm interested to know more about this. Your work, you were going to Edinburgh um, and working with Blanca, but that didn't happen. And so you have this wonderful lecture where you, you talked a little bit more about the work that she's done. But I guess my first question to you is, um, how did you restructure that work, the inability to take that show to Edinburgh? And how has that experience for the students broadened? I watched um, the, the film that you did of the students and I found it quite, quite, beautiful. And I'm interested to hear from you how those quick and nimble changes affected you as a professor and your students. Well, I love the words quick and nimble because that was, uh, that was exactly what was drawn from all of us um, at Penn and everywhere to pivot in the midst of um, an ongoing semester was a challenge for everyone. 
I would say that this semester for me personally it was particularly challenging because we were uh, in medias race with the Orlando uh, project. We were going to uh, perform it at Penn and then we we're going to take it over to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And I was terribly excited about it, as were the students, because of the involvement with Blanca Ziska. Uh, we had hired Blanca as the artistic resident this year at the University of Pennsylvania's Theater Arts Program. And Blanca and I have a long history. Um, she gave me my first professional job in theater that was at least since I was, I was sort of a child actor, but as an actual person, a, a newly minted MFA from Temple University many, many years ago, uh, she hired me at the old Wilma on Sansom Street to appear in the Harry Ape, the O'Neill play. So, and then I went on to, to uh, work with Yiddy on uh, Happy End, the Brecht play, uh, 1984. Um, I was a stand-in several times for other things. So Blanca and I um, uh, go way back, as she does with many people in Philadelphia. Um, she's such a, an incredible presence in our theatrical landscape. And so I was very thrilled to have her come and work with my students. She was going to impact the, um, the shape of the show that we were working on. We were working from Sarah Rule's adaptation of Virginia Woolf's novel, Orlando. And Blanca did, uh, luckily, came in a couple times to train the students. So they were exposed to the hothouse technique which um, I did talk, a, or she talked a lot about in the interview that, that I was um, fortunate enough to be able to conduct with her later on. So my students were at least given, given that level of exposure to um, all of the incredible theatrical energy that is Blanca Ziska and history. Her experience uh, in Czechoslovakia where she was a very young woman making theater at a time when the Soviet tanks rolled in and uh, there was um, suddenly, as she put it, everything changed overnight. And uh, she suddenly could no longer make the kind of theater that she and Yiddy had been making as young people studying with Jerzy Grotowski and all kinds of exciting people, um, Cantor in, in Poland and in Czechoslovakia. And um, what she brought to Philadelphia was this incredible energy of um, what Cornell West called um, uh, cultural capital, which is that energy of the immigrant, right, who discovers freedom where, where oppression had been. And uh, anyway, I'm talking a bit about things I discussed in my dissertation at, of course, greater length, but it was so exciting to be uh, near them theatrically, to learn from them at such uh, a moment in their growth as theater artists. And of course, it was wonderful to bring Blanca back now um, in the context of um, my direction of a, of a group of very young people uh, and for her to bring the energy that is, that is who she is now, which of course contains all of the years, the incredible capital campaign that brought the Wilma to where it is today. Um, I remember watching with, with great admiration as she and Yiddy uh, managed somehow to, to get the city and other investors uh, to invest in the very first purpose-built theater in Philadelphia in the previous 60 years. Of course, now we have the Arden and we have, we have a number of wonderful purpose-built uh, and, and architecturally interesting theaters in town. Um, but, uh, but the Wilma was, was one of the first to do that, to break ground. So for, there, there's a lot of reasons I'm excited about Blanca Ziska. And uh, I, I hope I don't go on too long about my enthusiasm <laughs> for her. Um, but to switch to the Orlando project, which, um, which I'm enthusiastic about as well, because you were very kind to watch the film. Um, I was really cutting my eye teeth as a, a film director slash editor, uh, sort of teaching myself uh, as, as I was um, putting together uh, something that, that, that reflected and honored the students' um, grief, really, about what they were experiencing in terms of the global pandemic. And what, what wound up ha happening was they took all of the energies and interests that they had in both the Virginia Woolf novel and um, the Sarah Rule play and made it very personal. And um, I, I pivoted in the middle of the semester 
and said, okay, we are, I'm not going to turn this into a book course. It would have been, that was my first thought. Okay, well, we'll just read several more Virginia Woolf novels. I had them read, of course, Orlando and A Room of One's Own. I just feel everyone has to read A, a Room of One's Own. Um, and uh, since Woolf was new to all of them, actually, that was a, um, that felt like a wonderful thing to open that door and then also to open the door of Blanca to bring these two women into the consciousness of these very talented young people was, was such a gift to me. Uh, I, I was so fortunate to, um, to uh, facilitate. To have that. Let me ask you about the, the program at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, is there a, a so I'm, I'm guessing from, from what you said and what it sounds like is Blanca brought this, the Grotowski hothouse technique to the students. And I'm wondering, is that the first time or the, certainly probably the first time they were that, it, the exposure was that in depth to that? Um, is, is physical theater or w making work in that way a part of the curriculum in the theater program or was that their first exposure and how did they, how did they gravitate towards? towards that's, a great, that's a great, great question. Great question. Yes, to the, the kernel of what happened this semester. Um, these, yeah. yes, we do have uh, a physical component to the curriculum. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be at Penn because I've taught in a lot of other places and I, I felt when I joined Penn 20 years ago that they really got it. They taught theater the way I felt theater should be taught, which is as a practice, uh, but also as a history, as a literature, as a tradition. Um, and so our, uh, our graduates are exposed to all of those things, but yes, they absolutely have to be, they have to take introduction to directing, they have to take introduction to acting, they have to take introduction to design, and they have opportunities to continue um, uh, with, an, with an enthusiasm, uh, you know, uh, of one kind or another. So um, all, all of the students involved in the Edinburgh Project were selected. There's an application process and they were uh, vetted by the faculty. So all of them were quite interested and enthusiastic about practice, uh, very excited to be actors um, and one, one stage manager um, uh, for, for this particular production. Um, and that's so that it, it very deeply embedded in the curriculum the practice is very important to us. And um, Blanca's particular technique was quite new for them. We've had residencies with Pig Iron. We've had residencies with Robert Smythe. We've had, we've had a lot of um, Sebastian Mundheim. We've had a lot of different artists come in because I think it's terribly important for the students to, um, especially, frankly, Philadelphia theater because as I'm sitting here with the great Tina Brock. Um, we have an amazing, I think, a tradition of experimental and um, as well as classical and um, all kinds of theater uh, going on here. And I've encouraged a lot of my students who are especially interested, especially talented, to stay put here in Philly and make theater. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to say that, that some of them have, and actually one of them is right here with us today. So. Uh, Mr. Haddad. Uh, but to get to get back to your question, so Blanca, but she brought something brand new and it was, um, it's, it was brand new to me as well because even though I've worked with her in the past as an actor, what she has evolved into and this technique that she has evolved um, bears with it the, the imprint of a lot of the artists, of course, that she has worked with from Tom Sp Stopper to Paula Vogel to um, Dial Oberlander-Smith to um, uh, to most importantly, um, and I can't, I won't even try to pronounce this name, Pavel, but also the Greek, the oh, Greek, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and, and, and so her technique is, is, uh, is extremely uh, exciting uh, for me as well and, and new. It does not, mm -hmm. it's, it's grown, it's grown, it's evolved. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the students were, I think, enough, it, although it was tragically cut short, mm -hmm. uh, I do think they got enough to know that they were getting something really special mm -hmm. from that residency. Well, I think there's, uh, you know, you talk a little, you, know, you, you mentioned Pig Iron and, and certainly um, many of the other physical, physically based organizations or companies in Philadelphia, but I think there's something very, very rooted in a just 
a whole different way of, of exploding the body um, in in the the Grotowski and some of the work that I'm you know that I'm seeing uh, and and it, it, hearing you talk about your early work with Blanca reminded me of going over to the the, the theater you worked in Neil Adrian on that main stage back way way back and they were uh, just doing it was so exciting to see that that's really one of the things that got me so excited about Philadelphia theater was seeing what they were doing in that hundred seat theater. Um, uh, on the road and just some of those very early productions. And then to see what happens when a company then has a purpose-built theater and has to uh, fill a house and where that goes. And I'm, I'm certainly, um, yeah, paying very close attention to, to the work that they're doing in the upcoming season and the way they're sort of apportioning three artistic directors, which I think is gonna be really interesting. I think, I'm glad that you're keeping people here in Philadelphia because I think when we all come out of this, it will be something drastically different mm -hmm. uh, in landscape, both individually for organizations individually and, and collectively. So, so that's you know something I think that we're all um, just like finding our way through right now and, and seeing what each of us can do on that landscape to, uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm very excited about the IRC's mission, because if we were ever at an existential crisis, now I've been, you know, going back and reading some of that Eastern European work, the Arabal, the, you know, some of those those plays that were written mid 20th century in a very different, but similar crisis of conscience and of, of ethics. And it's really, um, uh, you know, Blanca certainly carries with her a huge amount of, um, as you say, like, pedigree and also just experience um, in, in town. I want to ask you a little bit of a, a side question, Marcia, and that is we're taking a little bit of a detour, and that is in the fall, do you know, will you be, will you be online? Are you, has Penn decided what they're going to do yet uh, for classes? Penn has not decided what they're going to do yet, um, and indeed it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's presented me with a bit of a dilemma because I was slated to teach a freshman seminar um, of introduction to acting, which is something I love to do. And I, I woke up one morning with great clarity and I just thought, I, I can't teach. I can't teach acting the way I teach it over Zoom. I just can't. Um, it, I think it's something different. I think it's acting for the camera, maybe, which is a wonderful specialty. It's not my specialty. It is, I'm a theater actor. I, I teach um, acting for the theater. So I was, I've developed a different course, a different freshman seminar, um, which I'm very happy to teach either remote or live. But it, it personally, that was a bit of a dilemma. And, but I know there are all kinds of um, innovations happening by the same token. I, I feel perhaps I wasn't, uh, um, innovative enough to, to, to just make that work, but I just felt I, I couldn't bring myself to it the way I, I really feel honor bound to do. So no, Penn has not made up their minds. They, they've sent out six different possible scenarios ranging from hybrid, various hybrid possibilities, um, starting early and ending early and having half of the semester live and half of the semester uh, remote to um, full-on live, to full-on remote, and, and everything in between. And they've promised us that they're going to let us know, uh, I think, by the beginning of July. Um, but for a number of us, that's kind of late because we, won't, you know, we, we spend the summers often reorganizing our courses, revising and updating syllabi, uh, locating materials. I can't even get into my office right now. Uh, I'm prohibited by law state law and the university from setting foot in, in my office. So all of my materials, uh, I'm not the only one, of course, this is, I'm, I'm just a drop in the bucket, but this, this is uh, something that's, uh, it's, it's a real challenge that we're all facing in, in this particular moment. Uh, at and I think also with just not knowing where things are, it's got to be very tricky for everybody. What well, is for businesses and, and I think universities yeah. a lot, just not having any idea what the fall is going to bring and, Absolutely. and all of that. There was this, um, I don't know if you saw the article in the New York Times by uh, Frank Bruni, who's the, the end of, of college as we know it. And he's basically talking about how liberal arts are so very important and worried that if 
you know, the students go away or go towards something that is much more based in science and, 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 and we sort of leave the philosophers and the, and it, I mean, they're the folks that are, that are making sense of all of this for us and how very, very important that is as, you know, as we move ahead. And I think, yeah, I just don't think we can over, like I, you saying about, um, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm a, a theater professor. It, it, it's a little bit like, you know, how, <laughs> what can a theater company do right now? Okay, so theater isn't the first thing on everybody's list right now, probably of things to do. There's, there's a lot greater, um, you know, cultural, um, cultural, cultural milestones that we are learning how to manage. But as we start to work our way back, I'm sure that we've all been relying on, you know, art as a way of getting through this for each of us. And as you say, you're a theater instructor, but you're not, none of us are, uh, are teaching Zoom or doing a show on Zoom or doing a reading on Zoom or doing any of those things on Zoom is a much, much different experience than, uh, so I think to, to take a step back and say like, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I don't think everybody, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's one size fits all on this, but I do, I do hope that you are able to figure out where you're going. So you can, oh, I will. I, you, know, I mean, you know, they're figuring out where they're going. So. We'll, we'll figure it out. If I could do the Orlando project and, <laughs> and, fi and find some, some satisfaction in what we were able to accomplish with that, I feel quite confident that I will again, but to your point, um, Tina, and I think this, this goes back to the, the commitment that I see in the IRC to this, uh, the working through of existentialism, which of course is so historically relevant in this moment, and it has been in other moments as well, but the commitment of your theater company to grapple with that particular uh, topic has been so rich for your audiences and for, for me. Um, so um, I feel theater, live theater, where people are breathing in the same space, and I know that's a horrifying thought right now, but in fact that's, you know, bodies being in the same place is actually what theater is all about and someday we'll get there even if the place is you know spaced a certain way but it's where we find our humanity it's where we find out how uh character uh unfolds and reveals itself under the pressure of circumstances domestic and historical and all kinds of circumstances and so i i i'm a huge believer in the theater and in fact um you say, and you're correct, the theater is not the first place that universities or institutions look. But I'm happy to report that I was, I was um, lucky to be a faculty mentor to uh, a couple of students who were applying for a, a big prize at Penn. It's called the Presidential Engagement Prize. And it's a big chunk of money to put towards something that will benefit the community. And uh, it, the arts have never won. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's often Wharton students with very visionary projects to help with, um, you know, microeconomies in, in blighted places or um, science students who have discovered a way to help with water supplies and, and that sort of thing. But um, this year, my students' projects won, and their project was to bring improv training to all Philadelphia public school students grades six through 10. Uh, and it's amazing to me, I still can't believe that it won, but uh, President Gutman was very articulate about exactly why it won, why she chose it. And they're, these students are so visionary and, and these students are double majors. They're uh, majors in theater and cinema and also Wharton. So they're, they're business people. They, they know about data analysis and they know about uh, markets and marketing and a lot of things that could stand to make them a lot of money, but they are choosing to use those skills in the service of kind of spreading the word about what theater can do, build community, help with expression, give people the confidence to realize their own stories, to make their narratives for themselves, and to learn how to share that narrative with other people, which if we're looking around us at the world right now, um, sharing stories is, is the only way to find commonality, it seems to me. So, so I think when I get distressed um, that uh, theater is, is uh, subpar in some ways, every once in a while something like that happens to give me hope. <laughs> well, I think it always does come around, right, to the, 
the sense of us being able to connect with each other, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's taking, you see many thriving businesses where they're taking improv into corporations and they're taking yeah. improv into medicine and they're taking improv into, because we, because so much of our innate intelligence comes from the body and we learn over the years either to trust the mind more than the body or, but, you know, or, or we sort of lose that connection a little bit, um, which is why a lot of times in these organizations, you know, they'll bring in dance just a, as a way to kind of try to get people in touch with their own. So that's, that's, that's a really, um, well, first of all, congratulations. That's a, I mean, that's something I, I'm getting excited about thinking about it, how young kids can. Um, so there's a couple questions, Marcia, just jumping back to the Orlando project um, that uh, folks in the audience have, and I'll, I'll put them out to you. Um, so the students cast in Orlando, were they selected for the project in a way that wasn't a, sort of a traditional casting method? Did you, or yes. did you go through the same kind of, you know, tell us about what that looked like? Yes, um, it's, it's, uh, it's regarded as a capstone project for people who have really put in a lot of time and energy into the study and practice of theater in a serious way. Um, Penn is a wonderful campus and they have all kinds of theater groups, both extracurricular and, um, and in our program uh, curricular. Uh, so we look for, for students who, uh, who have committed to the program and to looking at theater in a certain way uh, who have taken a lot of classes, who are majors, who have um, volunteered for various positions, who have been stage managers and props designers, and um, who have showed up on work calls to help paint sets, but who have also taken roles in our productions, um, and who have written extraordinary papers in our classes, who have been uh, great contributors to class discussions, etc. So we're really looking for those special students who are especially committed and frankly, we're also looking at things like who would be a good person to travel with, who has the maturity to handle it if their suitcase is lost. <laughs> there, there's, a, 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 there's a certain level of maturity that, that you need to factor into this trip when you're, you're going abroad, things happen. Uh, and the, the Fringe, Edinburgh Fringe is, um, I've, done, I've been there several times, it's a wonderful festival, uh, but you, you have very little time to get in and out, the shows are are just packed one after another. You have, in our case, we had 90 minutes to arrive, carry everything on our backs every day. We had a week long uh, run, uh, you, you know, wear your costumes to the, to the venue or have them in a backpack and your props and, and everything else. And it's very highly choreographic. Everything really goes like clockwork. So um, looking for people who are up for that, you know, people who have the energy and who would think that was fun like I do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a certain. Yeah, it's a certain. It's, it's interesting because we think thinks that's great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you it's 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 really true that within the profession, you know, you see actors and we come to a theater and we rehearse and we go into the theater and we do a show. But there's so just like there's so many different kinds of doctors and so many different kinds of lawyers and so many different yes. kinds. Of, you know, actors come in all different sizes and shapes and forms, and some are better designed for, like, a small example is working over at the gallery. You know, some actors really get thrown by not having that proscenium around them or being able to, you know, be a foot away from someone in the audience, and that can be, and it can be very distracting when you don't have proper lighting that can mask everything out. So that makes total sense that you're looking for a very specific sort of facility and muscular uh, musculature that will um, take you. So now another question here is, so did, um, what, what was the student's final submission for Orlando? Was it the film that you put together? Uh, the film that we put together um, was the fruit of the, our pivot. Uh, and we will submit it to, um, to Philly Fringe um, and probably, uh, you know, the Edinburgh Fringe at this point, it does, it does feel, I think, to the students that we lost our moment. We lost our, we lost our time there. Um, whether or not we do submit it to the, to the digital fringe is, um, is a question that's still a little bit out there. Our focus has been on putting the film together. And uh, basically, I, uh, I invited the students uh, every week to submit a one to two minute video of their own making uh, in which they pulled on the materials of their roles, uh, the way they had been cast, and uh, and on the materials of the novel as well, 
to comment on their own experience of the pandemic, of quarantine, of everything that's been happening in their lives. And so much has been happening so quickly. I mean, I was just thinking, Tina, when, when you kindly invited me, uh, I, was, I was realizing so soon after we completed the film, this, um, all of these protests exploded. And I, I thought how interesting it would have been if, if our film had been able to overlap that reality as well and we could have gotten their perspectives on, on what's happening now in this country and all over the world. In fact, it's not just this country now. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it, at the time, our focus was the pandemic. And so they, they drew materials from the novel uh, and the play and made little documentaries from all over. They all were, one was in Anchorage, Alaska. There were a couple in Texas. Um, there was a, uh, another woman was sheltering in Philadelphia and uh, although she's from Colorado and they used all kinds of materials. They were very inventive and uh, warmed, warmed to the project. So uh, that's how it came about. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here about the work with Blanca and the students. Did, did you feel, what are the ways in which you felt you could see the result of that work in the work um, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, since it's such a, a a visceral thing that you can feel when you are in the room, you can feel yes. it when you're in the theater, certainly at the Wilma. But uh, it's it's such a it's such a physical energy thing. Um, what are the ways it translated for you or and or the students? What an interesting question, and I, I haven't had an opportunity to really think about that. So thank you for that question. I would say. Uh, without giving it too much thought, I, I would say that the students um, took the opportunity to unmask themselves, which was something that Blanca discussed quite a bit about how society and um, culture and expectations really um, lead us to contain the body and not move in certain ways and not make certain vocalizations. And that the hothouse technique is largely about freeing um, the actor so that they can access what they already have, which is why she calls it the technique, she's calling it the knowing body, because she feels that she maintains that she's not teaching actors anything that they don't already have. She's helping them um, unleash uh, energies and um, knowledge that their body already contains. And what a wonderful concept for um, students who are being asked to create little mini documentaries uh, to, to have in their tool pack. And um, I, you've seen the film, so there's a, a, young, uh, a young man who speaks about um, gender um, uh, quite beautifully. And I, I, I can't but think that um, his experience with Blanca um, might have led him to make those kinds of connections uh, across Orlando um, with his own experience. Uh, basically, he says, that one of the un unexpected uh, uh, benefits of quarantine was that he didn't have to go out into the world every day and perform his gender for the world, that he could relax and just be the person he is, um, much the way Orlando does, uh, no matter, Orlando, of course, is male for the first 250 years of their existence and female for the second um, uh, 250 years in that wonderful timeless novel um, and uh, and yet part of Virginia Woolf's point is Orlando is exactly who they are and of course they're a man and of course they're a woman at whatever point in the novel they happen to be. So Tias took that knowledge and that certitude and said okay I'm, I'm non-binary and that's wonderful and that's who I am and I'm able to be that in this quarantine because I don't have to perform it I can I can embrace that. And I, I find that a very moving part of the film, personally. Um, and I think Blanca's work, which is so deep, it's just so beautiful, the way she gets the students um, and actors. I mean, if you've seen some of the hothouse work, um, there's such raw, um, uh, I would say, raw physicality and emotional work that goes on in, in those productions that, of course, we, again, I'm not making any great grandiose claims because we didn't get the time with her that we of course hoped to have had. But nonetheless, even just being exposed to those concepts and to someone with great reverence for the body and great reverence 
for um, for what our body knows mm -hmm. and, and to see that as an artistic tool, I think had to impact the storytelling that went on in the film. Right. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, not having been a student of a conservatory here in the United States, but certainly like just from the, the time we're children and we build up um, so many layers of things, it really does become a process of taking away the layers to get to the authentic, the instinctual self in mm -hmm. there. And I think that's a, that's a form or a, a practice that does a great job, at least in its, what it sets out to do is to strip all of that away and get the most raw, um, and, you know, place because that's when the truth is there. Um, Indeed. And I think if you, you know, if we're, if we layer, uh, it, it's easy, I think, to get, uh, and particularly when you, you know, even in university of kids coming from all over the country or whatever, and they're coming from different races and religions and places and things and everything, we bring it all into the room. And then sometimes it just gets, things get lopped on top, lopped on top, lopped on top. And you just have to, you just have to think about like, what can we take away? What can, yeah. what can we take away to get to the, the real, the real thing, the real deal. Um, this is a, a bit of a jump back to an earlier question about teaching online. Um, there's a question that some um, professors in acting are feel that see teaching, you know, teaching classes online is kind of an ethical question. Would you say that that is, is it fair to say that that's the way you feel? Huh. Um, I, I guess I don't quite understand the question. I mean, ethical in what way? What's the ethos? I mean, is it that you feel you're, I, I mean, I'm going to interpret because this is not a you know, okay. question, but do you feel that you are somehow, um, I'm, I'm assuming this is the, this is the, uh, this is the question, um, is, is that are you not doing it justice by, I mean, it's a little bit where you were going with it. It's like, it, like I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't hired to teach classes on Zoom. I'm an acting instructor and I need to be in the room. It's like, I'm not gonna do a show where I've got to, you know, like I briefly considered that, like let's do rehearsals on Zoom. I was like, no, 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 this is not that. For, the, for, the, for one of the reasons you just pointed out is I think there are many people who, feel like life, ha it, it, for whatever reason, they have to be fairly performative in their life when they go out into the world because it either demands it of us or we fall into this role. And I think a lot of people have, have realized both in their personal lives and their professional lives that like, I don't have to do that for right now. And I, I've heard a lot of people, maybe not in such profound ways as what your student was discussing, but to say like, wow, there's this newfound freedom. But Sidebar, getting back to your the other question, is it that you just really don't feel that as a professor you can give, you can really bring your full self to the table with it? It's, is there is a question about like, well, this is the course, but you're not really getting the course in the same way that like a lot of students are saying, you know, it's not the same thing, people. Like, I really need to be in a room, you know? You know, it's, it's a, thank you for clarifying. Um, and I would absolutely say it's a personal ethics for me, but it's a hybrid answer because I feel strongly that for me, the teaching of acting that I do uh, is physical, it involves the body, the breath, the voice, and proximity, <clears throat> excuse me. So to me, I, I just, as I said, I, I kind of woke up with this clarity. I, I don't believe I want to, it, it means too much to me. It's almost like a, it, it's something that I, I've spent so many years in, in doing this in the classroom and it, it's so meaningful to me. It's, it's almost um, beyond just being a professor in a class and teaching a, a, a class that doesn't, you know, it's just over and over. It's always about the group of individuals in the room. I always grow to care very deeply for my students somehow. It just, and, and, and Zoom doesn't have that, the immediacy or the physicality that I think is required by the teaching of theatrical acting. I will say I have a great respect for, for film acting and, the, and technique, and I believe that's a whole different question that I am not um, suited to, uh, to, to judge. I think, I think there are probably several people that can do wonderful things on Zoom with, um, with a different kind of orientation towards, towards acting, and, and I think it's, it's great. But the reason it's a hybrid 
question is that I don't feel that way with regard to my academic courses. So for example, the course that I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a theater history class and I'm teaching um, a course in, it's called dark comedy in theater and film. So I, I cross list it with the cinema studies program and the English department um, and theater arts. Uh, I get a, a variety of students of different backgrounds and perspectives. And that course I feel very much is, uh, would be perfectly fine over Zoom. We'll be looking at film closely. We'll be looking at plays closely, doing close readings um, of both. At, but it, it does not require the vulnerability that teaching acting asks of students. It does not ask them to take personal risks with their emotional and physical mm -hmm. beings uh, to, uh, and, and a class like that, I'm not asking them to become an ensemble. Uh, with my acting classes, I ask them to become an ensemble, which as you know, Tina, has carries with it a very special set of um, almost protective and mutually supportive ideals. So as a hybrid answer, I hope that's not too much, but I, I feel differently about the different courses. As you're speaking, it makes, um, I'm thinking about your student and his exploration into and safety within being in his, you know, in, in this different world, um, but also what the work that Blanca is trying to get them to do. You're not really, you know, film is a director's medium. It's sort of like you are one person with a, with a thing, <laughs> you know, with a lens. <laughs> And, uh, and it, it lacks the, what happens when you put a bunch of ingredients into a stew and those things bake or brew or cook to become something entirely different. So um, I, I do think that your point is well taken, what you're asking people to do to get rid of these layers of themselves and, and be, very exposed to other human beings and not be able to hide from that in any way is certainly not what this is testing. It's my job to protect that. It's my job as, as the, the adult in the room with a group of students, undergraduates uh, particularly, and freshmen, freshman seminar and introduction to acting, uh, I, I get very um, protective of their dignity, their, um, the, the dignity of the ensemble, uh, and I would add, though, that um, Blanca's amazing. I, I've spoke with her um, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I think it's very different when you're working with an ensemble of professional actors. And she and her actors have been coming up with exercises and techniques and um, finding resonances in their rooms and um, working with surfaces in you know, wood and, and walls and... Uh, and finding ways to continue the work, continue the, 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 the physicality um, on, a, on a very professional level. Uh, and I think, but I do think that's a different, a different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think if you take, you take yourself as an individual, like just like we're saying about your student, there's a lot of ground and terrain to be mined. Even just being within a room with other people, but you're having this singular experience that you can then sort of, you can share with someone else. I, I think work is possible and work can be done. And I think mm -hmm. movement can happen. And like, just like you're saying, we're certainly seeing that. I think when you put it together to try to translate it for an audience, it presents so many really, really interesting challenges. Um, there was a joke made recently, somebody's like, well, you know, Beckett would be a really great thing to do because, you know, there's not a lot of lines and, you know, <laughs> you know and, and sort of, and, and thinking about that, but it just, all existential theater relies on being in existence in that space. That's why Beckett was so very clear, right, about the conditions under which he wanted these pieces to be done and the scenery and the space and the vibration of the space. So when that's not happening, you know, I, I think it really calls into question, um, you know, I mean, not calls into question, but it raises questions about the validity of like, what is the thing you're trying to measure? You know, and, and that's exciting to hear that they're doing some, some really, and it doesn't surprise me that they're doing really interesting work because I do think in isolation, in the same way therapy can happen, you know, over this, yeah. but it's a di very different kind of experience. Um, yeah. Um, I guess a, a couple of questions before we, this has been such a, a, a really great 
time to get to know more about, you know, your year, your thwarted year. Will you go back to, um, and thwarted's not a good word to use, I don't think, because you certainly, it sounds like it was very fruitful on, on so many different ways, but like, will you then go back to Edinburgh in two years? Will you go back in one year? I mean, will you just sort of, this year happened and you'll go back in two years if you decide to you know, that's a faculty decision. That's something that we will make as a group. Um, and uh, we've been so busy just coping. <laughs> just coping yeah, with, with long term thinking. Together, serving our students um, and also everything that's going on at the university level, trying to respond responsibly as, um, as a group of educators to this moment in all of its dimensions. I mean, what an incredible moment for for educators, for everyone, for as you said, for everyone, but it's pulling up for all of us some really um, important decisions, and uh, and I think th those are great questions, and I and I don't have answers, and I I won't have answers until a of, uh, yeah, that's a sort of, of no, I understand you know a discussion going with my colleagues about that. But you have big institutional questions, that are, and it's such know. a pity that you know what something that's come up, Tina with a lot of um, people who've seen the film or, or they're kind of rooting for these particular students because they did such lovely work in their, in their video work. Uh, and there's like, oh, can't you bring them together to, to create, the, you know, to, to, to put on Orlando? Can you get this production up in one or two years? But as you well know, um, there's, a, there's a moment when actors have availability in their schedules and students, and then everyone goes on to other projects and that time really does not come again, or if it does, that's a very rare circumstance. So I isn't think- it why, Isn't it why it's special? Like you think about remounts of things, or you exactly. think about, it, it, art gets created within the time and the space and the energy around it. It's a little bit like people are saying, you know, I, I'm actually now able to pick up books and start to read for plays for, but for this whole entire time, the context was just law. Not that there wasn't great context happening. It's just trying to make sense of our, my, the IRC's role in that context becomes very challenging because of all that we don't know. We know what we feel, you know, but we just don't know what the right response is. So it's, I, it, it's not a terribly fair question to say to you, like, what will happen? It's a small thing down the line, but I guess we very know. fair it's very fair and actually i think it's right on the money because precisely the inability to make plans the inability to look at the future um is the point and it's actually i think in some ways the point of existentialism is making sense in a vacuum how does one do that what is that's the human condition and at the moment it's it's also the condition of educators and artistic directors and students and um, and many of us, not all of us perhaps, but um, it also emerged quite spontaneously. I did, not, I did not direct the thematic material coming out of my students' work um, when they made their little documentaries at all, but it turned out to be the theme, this very question of, of, of the, the short film we made, um, which there's a line that almost all of them pulled out to, to work from. There's a line from the play and the novel uh, where, uh, Orlando says, I believe it's Orlando says, um, what a terrifying revelation. What can be more terrifying than the revelation that it is the present moment? We are protected on one side by the past and on the other by the future. But, um, but the present moment is raw and unyielding. And my students were all stuck in this present moment. You know, Penn students are very organized. They tend to be, you know, forward looking and taking all kinds of, you know, else that's this and, and MCAT's that and, and whatever else that they're, they're doing, um, they're organized, they're future forward looking and they were stopped in their tracks. And so they all gravitated towards this notion. So your, your question to me is precisely what, what emerged from at least the, the Orlando project. And, and it's the question that faced a lot of existential authors and absurdist playwrights and the literature, the wonderful literature that came out of their, their answers to that question I believe uh, is some of the greatest literature that we have. So I'm so happy and grateful for your company in our city. We're so lucky to have you. Well, thank you, Marcia. Um, it certainly is a time, I think, the convergence of events where people really have little control over what happens and are sort of faced with, you know, 
with just being and what will we create. It's, it's extraordinary. And I, and I am very excited to be, excited is probably too strong a word, but, but interested and curious about what, how many writers in today's world, how many of these young writers, you know, Annie Baker, you know, a lot of these writers will be writing about when we come out of this. Um, Great question. It, it's going to be just really interesting and fascinating to see how they craft the existentialist uh, experience now. Um, and also to look at Beckett and Ionesco through the eyes of what this means now, you know, of, of what this, this yes. is a large uh, once in a century or hopefully um, event looks like. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to be with us. And uh, I wish you thank a you. fall season at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Marsha Ferguson, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, thank you so much for being with us today here on Into the Absurd. And for everyone in the audience, thank you so much for your questions. We look forward to seeing you next week at five o'clock when we will continue to bring more good nothingness to life. Um, and we hope you'll join us then. Thanks. <laughs>